Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16, pretty familiar passage. When Jesus spoke these words, go into all the world, preach the gospel. When He spoke these words, the population of the world was roughly 250 million people. And during that time, life expectancy was about 45 to 50 years. Child mortality rate was extremely high. Almost two thirds of the world's population were either slaves or in poverty. Life was hard, life was violent, life was short. And most people lived in only you know, one part of the world at that time. And so the responsibility to proclaim the gospel to all was still a daunting task for 12 um, uneducated, mostly uh, Jewish men, and later one very well educated Roman Jew, uh, Saul, who became Paul. But they accomplished the mission in their generation because the Holy Spirit says through Paul, the apostle in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, that the gospel was proclaimed in all creation. Since the first century, things have changed drastically. Technology and science have provided an easier life and one that lasts longer, 75 to 80 years. Of course, we recognize that God is the one who gives and takes life, but we understand what I mean by science and technology. The things that God has permitted has given us a longer lifespan today. People live in every area of the earth and do so in more freedom than ever before, despite the wars and the things that are going on now, much more freedom in the world than there was back in the first century. There are also more people than before. By the year 1800, the world population had gone from 250 million in the first century to one billion in the 18th century. Then two billion in 1920, three billion in 1960, four billion in 1974, five billion in 1980, uh, seven, and then six billion in the year 2000. And now we add a billion people every decade. So what took 1800 years to happen now takes place every 10 years. So my point here is that even if the societies have changed and the numbers have grown, the word of the Lord remains exactly the same. What Jesus said to the apostles 2,000 years ago that was just read is exactly the same words that we read today, 2,000 years later, six billion people. So the responsibility of the church is to go out and proclaim the gospel to still all of creation. Notice he didn't put numbers in. He just said everybody, everybody who's there. So we still have that responsibility, and that's all seven billion plus people in this world, and to do it in our generation. This is the challenge of our time. Why should we take it up? Why should we go? I mean, the Lord is kind. He's not dealt with us as a dictator, but rather like a father. He could simply command without reason, only with threat of punishment, but he doesn't do this. He gives us reasons why he commands this particular task. And so when it comes to the preaching of the gospel to the whole world, he provides several reasons why this is necessary to keep us motivated from generation to generation. So we preach the gospel today in our time, in our age, because, uh, well, because of sinfulness, that's why. In Romans 3.23, Paul says, that all have sinned, everybody, all seven billion, three billion, 40 billion, doesn't matter. Whether we're living on planets and moons and you know, wherever we're living, you know, the Bible doesn't change. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, Paul also says that the wage of sin is death. The same consequences, doesn't matter how many people there are, the consequences are the same. You know, the great lie in our world is that people are really okay, or that they can kind of fix themselves if they have to. 
you know, people should simply be freed from their anxieties uh, over what's right and wrong and be liberated just to be themselves or, or be free to practice democracy, for example. That's the, the biggest, that's the gospel of today. If everybody could just practice you know, democracy or capitalism, everything would be fine, right? But when they do free themselves, they don't know who they are or the people they do become are unhappy and depressed. You know, like in Russia, they've been freed for a time, freed to practice democracy of a, of a kind and capitalism of a kind. And what has happened to that country without the gospel? Well, they've turned their country over to greedy crooks. That's what's happened. The truth that is brought out by the gospel is that people are not okay and the problem is their sinfulness and forgiveness and restoration with God, that's the answer, not social or political freedom. That's good, that makes life better, but it doesn't fix things. It doesn't fix things in here. You know what I'm saying? So why, why preach the gospel? Because only the gospel identifies what the real problem is. The real problem is Personal sinfulness, that's the real problem. It doesn't matter what society, doesn't matter what language, what place, what culture, what time, doesn't matter how many people live in your country or not. You know, the smallest country with only a population of you know, one million or the biggest country with a population of 1.2 billion, they have the same problem when it comes to sin. Everybody is guilty of it and because of that, other problems exist. So why preach? Well, because sin exists and the gospel reveals what the problem is. Why preach? Well, because of Jesus Christ, that's why. Peter says in Acts chapter four, verse 12, that there is, no sal there is salvation in no one else under the sun. You know, people say to Christians, you people are awfully exclusive. You, know, you think you're the only ones going to heaven and so on and so forth. Well, I'm sorry about that. Really I am. All I'm doing is following what the scriptures say and the scriptures tell me that there is salvation in no one else except Jesus Christ. I'd like to make room for your God or your prophet or your mullah or whoever you are. I'd like for it to be everybody, but it, unfortunately it says in the inspired word that there is salvation in only one person, just one. You can hate me for that. You can beat me up and reject me for that. You can call me a fool, a bigot, narrow-minded. You can call me all kinds of names for that. But you know what? What you call me does not change what is. What is? And what is is that there is no other name under heaven by which anyone can be saved. And that's why we are forced to preach the gospel. We have no choice. There are many religions in this world that have managed to identify the problem as man's moral failure. The Buddhists, they talk about that. However, the solutions they offer are inadequate to solve the problem. They either offer ways for man to try to control sin or they explain how to cope with sin without guilt or they offer paradise where there is no sin or where it's okay to sin, but sin, it's always there. Only Jesus Christ actually deals with sin and eliminates sin. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, He Himself bore our sins in the body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by His wounds you were healed. What's wrong with me? I'm sin sick. That's what's wrong with me. And Peter says that through Christ my sin sickness is healed. Do you know that no other religion expresses that idea as their basic tenet? Did you know that? Only Christianity says to people, Jesus will heal your sin sickness. You will be better. 
So the gospel reveals the fact that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins so that we would not have to, thereby liberating us from the fear of death and condemnation at judgment. Why? Because sin exists. So there are many prophets and there are many saviors and gurus and philosophies and religions, but there is only one resurrected Lord and the gospel is the medium that delivers Him to the world. That's why we preach. And then we also preach because of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, I read this for you. Paul says, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. And by the way, this is, this is the, the angst that you feel. This is the back and forth that you feel. This is the discomfort that you feel from day to day as a Christian that sometimes you, you can't put your finger quite on it. But, but, but Paul is explaining that here. Your flesh is dead, it's sinful, it's dead, it's always craving things that are against the spirit. But he says as Christians, your spirit is alive and so it just keeps going back and forth and back and forth. You know? and, and that gets so tiring at times but that's what it is. And I tell you, thank God that that is happening inside of you. Get on your knees and thank God that's happening inside of you because that tells you, you are alive in Christ. Because where there's no struggle, there is no life. Where there is no struggle, there is no life. And he goes on to say, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. You know, from Geritol to ginseng, people are looking for the elixir that will make them feel better, look better, stay younger. Of course, this search for self-improvement in mind and body is our way of coping with the inevitability of death. We, we kind of want to put it off. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, tried just about everything there was to do in his life. Money, power, glory, women, pleasure, entertainment, art, science, building projects. And when he came away from it all, he said that it was empty because in the end you died. And nothing changes that. The gospel of Jesus Christ announces to people that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the prototype, is the preview of their own resurrection from the dead, which will be powered by the Holy Spirit. That's what he said in Romans 8. He said, if the, if the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, if that spirit is inside of you, well, in the same way that he raised Jesus from the dead, he will also raise you from the dead. Because if he can do it for Jesus, he can do it for you. Why do we preach? We preach to tell people that there is resurrection. No one else promises this. What people need are not makeovers or youth products or money or power. They need the Spirit of God living inside of them. People need this, but they don't know this is what they need. Those who proclaim the gospel are fulfilling man's greatest desire, the need to live beyond death provided by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to the apostles, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he shall do also, and greater works than these he shall do. Jesus gave the Holy Spirit to 12 men, but through the preaching of the gospel, we today can offer the Holy Spirit to billions and billions of people on this earth. We can do that through the preaching of the gospel. So this brings me to the next question concerning our battle, and that question is, how? I mean, in the first century, there was a combination of factors that produced a situation that made worldwide preaching of the gospel actually possible. There were several factors that contributed to this situation. First of all, a thing called the Pax Romana, 
the Pax Romana was a hundred years of relative peace in the Roman Empire, which permitted free movement throughout the known world at the time. Very important if you're wanting to spread a message to the then known world. The second thing was the road system. The Romans were road builders, and so there was, uh, uh, those who traveled were able to move more quickly and easily than ever before in history. It was very important. A third thing was the Greek language. The Greeks had a very strong influence on culture to the point where their language became the literary and common language for different countries, permitting the gospel to spread from one country to another because these countries had a similar language. And then finally, the synagogue system. The Jews had traveled worldwide and they had established synagogues in all the major cities of the empire. And those who promoted and preached the gospel had a ready platform in every city to proclaim the good news. All of these things just came together at the time when the gospel was ready to be preached. So God gave them the commission to proclaim to all the world, but He provided the resources to allow this to happen. In our day, and on our age, God is still in charge of the world, believe it or not. And I believe that even if man thinks that all the resources and technology are for man's benefit, God can and will use it to His glory and for the purpose of His gospel. Even though there are seven billion people and counting, we are given the charge to proclaim the gospel to all of them in our generation. And we can do it because God has also provided exclusive, important resources in our day and in our time. For example, language. It's not the Greek language, it's the English language. English is still the universal language to this day and wherever it is not spoken, people want to learn it. It is the language of universal communication. It's the language of universal travel. Number two, printing. They had very few books in the first century and no printing at that time. But now the Bible is printed and distributed in almost every language to every country in the world. I mean, you can view the Bible in every single language and many different versions of it for free on the internet. Imagine that. And then communication. It is now possible to communicate with almost every single person on earth through radio or television or through the internet without ever leaving your house. They had to get on boats, they had to walk, they had to ride. We can stay right here and talk to anybody in the world. And then of course mobility. We can still easily travel pretty much anywhere in the world relatively quickly and relatively cheaply. You know, at first it seems like an impossible task to reach seven billion people. But when you realize that we are not just 12, but the disciples of Jesus number in the millions today, and the resources we now have are a match for the job at hand, and it is doable. It's not impossible. So how are we going to do that? Of course, what's left, as I say, to describe is the how. You know, here are some of the resources that God has given us, but what are we going to do? We can evangelize using the tools that we have at our disposal today. This begins by finding a way to get the gospel message to those around us. And you know what? Each congregation has a variety of tools to accomplish this task. Not everybody has the same thing, but we all have all kinds of very good tools to use. For example, we can use mail-outs to the community. One of the suggestions in that five-year plan is that we regularly, four times a year, each season, we mail out something from the church here to communicate with our neighbors, letting them know we're here and what we're doing, what we're offering. I mean, there are campaigns and advertising, door knocking, VBS, Invite a Friend Sunday, Visitation, the use of television and radio and the internet, of course, World Bible School, we're talking to people halfway across the world. Those people are hearing the gospel and being baptized and being taught by somebody who's sitting in a room over there on a Wednesday night. No budget is too small and no effort is ever wasted. There's a harvest out there, but we have to actually get out there to try to reap it. We need to remember that part of that seven billion, part of it, not all of it, but part of that seven billion is our personal responsibility and not just the preacher's job or not just the mission, missionary's job. 
part of it is our job. And then finally, we need to ask when. When are we going to do that? Well, the apostles were told to begin when they received power from the Holy Spirit. And when they did, they immediately began preaching Christ to their countrymen and others. And of course, we know that on Pentecost Sunday, 3,000 were baptized as a response to their preaching. Acts chapter two, verse 37 to 41. Now listen, the earth's population will continue to grow at a pace of 1.5 million people per week. Think about that. A million and a half people a week, that's how fast the population is going. And a majority of these people will not be born into Christian families. Not like that little baby. That little baby's got a Christian mama and a Christian papa and a Christian sister. Sister, yeah. But the majority of that 1.5 million, they're not being born into that type of, of, Christian, of Christian home. Even here in the United States, easily the most Christian of countries, the latest Pew Research poll on religion in America notes that the trend in our nation is that number one, the percentage of those who identify themselves as Christians has fallen from 77% of the population to 71% of the population, and it continues to trend downwards. Another note that's interesting that, that was found in this uh, latest uh, Pew Research poll, more millennials, when I talk about millennials, that, those are born from 1981 to 1997, those are the millennials, okay? More millennials are describing themselves as non-religious or non-affiliated with any church. Now the significant thing about this is that it is these millennials, ages 18 to 36 years of age, who will be raising the next generation of children. Think about that for a moment. So here in our nation, we face the challenge of reaching out to a growing world population, but we have less people now willing to do this than in the previous generation. In other words, there's more people to reach, but there are less Christians to do the outreach. And that's where we're at in 2015. The answer to the question when is obvious. Now is always the time to begin despite the challenges facing our own time in history. Of course, it's always been a challenge to preach the gospel to all nations. Perhaps the place to really begin is with ourselves. Let's make sure that we ourselves have obeyed the gospel by confessing our faith in Jesus, repenting of our sins and having been baptized or immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins and the reception of that Holy Spirit who will raise us one day. We have several among us uh, who believe and I know you, know you get to know people, we have many here who are believers, but they've not yet obeyed Jesus Christ in this matter. So when do you begin evangelizing yourself? The answer to that is as soon as possible. As soon as possible. Our next step in evangelizing the world is to evangelize our own families, especially our children. Of course, we should share our faith with our parents and our siblings and other family members when possible, but you know what? We're not responsible for our parents. We're not responsible for our, 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 uh, our siblings. I'm not responsible for my friend, you understand what I'm saying? But I am responsible for both the physical and the spiritual welfare of my children in a very special way. You know, the Solomon says, train up a child in the way he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Notice he doesn't say, train up uh, your brother-in-law in the way he should go, or train up your next door neighbor in the way they should go. No, no, he says, train up the child, your child. That's your responsibility. And Paul in the New Testament says, fathers, notice fathers, in our day and time, it's the mothers that do most of the teaching of the children concerning the Bible, concerning God. And yet, when the inspired apostle is laying the responsibility down, who does he lay it down on? He lays it down on the father. Fathers, 
Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, fathers. Evangelizing neighbors or people in far off places, you know, that can be difficult and expensive, but the church provides all kinds of services and resources that makes evangelizing our own children easy. Not easy to convert somebody in Kenya, but we have a, we have a missionary in Kenya that we support. But our children, they live in our houses. We have control over their time. And you know what, brothers and sisters, you know, let's get real here for a moment, shall we? The problem is not the children. The problem is the parents. Not the children, the parents. We have classes for all ages on Wednesday evenings, Sunday mornings, but more than half of our children are missing on Wednesday and we rarely have full attendance on Sunday mornings at Bible class. You know, we're, we're, we're building a very active youth and family program here. We've got a terrific young minister and his wife in Mike Coghill and Jessica. They're enthusiastic, they're going all out. But a lot of teens in this congregation are simply not encouraged to participate in any of the activities. Why is that? It would be one thing if these children and young people were being carefully taught the scriptures at home by their parents, but you know what? I suspect that most are not. You ask any parent here who for whatever reason neglected to encourage their children to participate in Bible class and Wednesday worship and youth, cast, uh, youth classes and so on and so forth. You ask any of the older parents here whose children are already grown and gone, you ask them, how faithful or spiritually mature their grown-up children are today if they haven't begun doing what they're supposed to do when they were younger. Ask them if their grandchildren are being brought to Cradle Row and VBS and Wednesday Bible class and youth camp their parents who didn't attend any of these things while they were growing up. Why? Uh, you, know, you name the reason. Brothers and sisters and parents, if we don't teach and evangelize our children ourselves, I guarantee you that the world will not do it for us at school or at t-ball practice or at basketball camp. I guarantee you that. Evangelization of the world begins with the evangelization of our own homes and our own children. Believe me, if you are not ruthless and not letting anything get in the way of evangelizing your children, they will be swallowed up in the glitter and the busyness and the allure of this world. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Coming to church, to class, to Wednesday service, to VBS, has always been harder than not to come. What else is new? <laughs> what else is new? It's always been difficult. Okay, so the call to evangelize begins with ourselves, and then our homes, and then our families, and ultimately spreads to our neighbors and our nation and the world. As I mentioned before, the church provides many opportunities to participate in evangelizing beyond our homes and families. Uh, the most effective, you know what the most effective evangelism method is? You invite your friend to come to church. That's the most effective one. No, no one has beaten that yet in 2,000 years. Hey, what do you do on Sunday? Are you a church person? No, yeah, well, why don't you come? You know, there's a series going on. Or the, just come, try it, no pressure, you know, no pressure. You can sit with me, I'll pick you up, I'll call you. Number one best method, going, okay? We have World Bible School. You want to volunteer for that? You'll be teaching somebody directly, right? VBS, once a year. VBS and camp, number one evangelization method of young people. And I'll, invent, I'll mention one more tool, and thanks that uh, Harold mentioned it, and of course that's Bible Talk, our online teaching and preaching website. Since that is my own chosen way to teach and evangelize beyond my own home, beyond my own family, Hal and I provide every member here who has a smartphone the opportunity to have a free Bible Talk app which allows them to watch or read Bible Talk materials on their phones. It's available. You know, you want to evangelize? Before you leave today, pull out your smartphone, go to iTunes or the App Store, type in BibleTalk.tv 
Get the free app, it'll be on your phone. Just press a button, you'll, you'll have access to 1,300 different lessons, series, videos, devos, blog posts, okay? And what's really great is that the moment you talk to somebody else who's not a Christian and it happens to turn to religion, you can pull out your phone and say, do you have a phone? Oh uh, yeah, the, the new whatever, the, the iPhone 6 that people wasted their, I mean people bought. <laughs> Hal will remain nameless. Uh, and say, yeah, you got a smartphone. Yeah, oh, I got a cool thing I want to share with you. Okay, everybody, lo everybody loves that, right? Okay, go to the iStore. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, type in BibleTalk.tv. Okay, there you go, free app. You have just shared with them 1,300. Sermons, lessons, blogs, devos, encouragements. That's viral evangelism. That's vi and you know what? Except for Ron, there are 250 million smartphones in the United States. Ron Egger is the last one who does not have one of those. He's, he's, he's got one of these. You know? I like to bug him, he's my friend. Look at it this way. It's as if I'm available to teach the Bible to your friend or your family anywhere, anytime, on any device. Why wouldn't you use that? <laughs> In the old days, you'd have to set up an appointment and then I would go to that person's house and we would have a Bible study and answer questions. And then I could only take one appointment, maybe two, you know, if, I, you know, if it was a good night. Now I can teach a hundred people, or a thousand people, or a million people, anytime, anywhere, any place. All that's needed is for someone to share this app with someone else and then follow up next time you see them. So did you check out the app? Yeah, there was some stuff. Well, I had a question about something. Okay, go ahead. Of course, this is not the only one of, this is only one of the many tools that the church provides to equip each member with the resources to help them share their faith. You know, our mission statement, Hal and I with Bible Talk, it says BibleTalk.tv, grow your faith, share your faith. Grow your faith, share your faith. Now you're going to find, uh, this is the commercial time here of the sermon, you're, you're going to find inside the bulletin two of these here. People still like paper. You find two of these, very simple, it just says Bible Talk, BibleTalk.tv teaches you the Bible and helps you teach the Bible to others. With over 1,300 lessons, uh, we have something for everyone, no matter where you are in your journey, and then it says available on Apple, Google, uh, you know, Fire, Roku, uh, Apple TV, Kino, it's any device that anybody owns, they can get Bible Talk on it. So you have two of these. Here's your assignment. Your assignment is give them to somebody. Just give them to somebody this week. You're at the doctor's office, leave it there. Sorry, uh, Carrie. Carrie's going to have to a whole bunch of sheets there. You're at, you're at the uh, optometrist's office, bring a thousand. <laughs> Corey won't mind. Evangelize, get out there. You know what? God will bless your effort. God will bless your effort. Not only in Bible talk, obviously I'm particular to that. Hal and I work pretty much exclusively on that, but all the resources that we have. So in closing, let me, let me offer the opportunity to anyone here today who's not yet obeyed the gospel to do so now. How do you do that? You confess that you do believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You make the decision to turn away from sin in your life and you're buried in the waters of baptism. Also, bring your iPhones and your Android phones forward, so to speak, and, 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 and install BibleTalk.tv. If you do that, you've come forward today. You don't have to come down the front. If you don't know how to do that, Hal and I will be back in the foyer there and we'll show you how to do it before you leave. Please. If you need to respond in any way that you can, please do so now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.